My brief talk today is going to be on hypertension, controversies to consensus on the management of hypertension, and the outline of my talk, briefly about the history and blood pressure measurement, something about the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which is coming up in a big way, hypertension, the Indian scenario, the guidelines for hypertension, several guidelines, the similarities and the differences, the recent trials and their practical implications, special cases, hypertension, diabetes, CKD, chronopharmacology, and finally the conclusion. We all know that the first blood pressure measurement was done in 1733 by Stephen Hales. He measured the height of a column of blood after cannulating the carotid artery in a hose with a brass pipe and it was attached to a 12-inch glass tube. And you may think, what is the connection between this goose and the pressure? The connection is that the brass pipe was connected to the glass tube with the trachea of the goose. This was long back. Nothing else was available at that time. And after that, the direct arterial blood pressure measurement came and then the standard indirect method which we are all doing today. But always remember this great statement by Norman Kaplan who is the authority on hypertension. The measurement of blood pressure is the clinical procedure of greatest importance that is performed in the sloppiest manner because we do not pay attention to the manner in which the blood pressure should be taken due to various reasons. If you look at the guidelines, we are all familiar with the guideline, but we are not able to follow that due to various reasons. The average of three readings, the patient should be asked to refrain from smoking, drinking tea or coffee, should take a rest, should not be exercising for the previous 30 minutes, Allow the patient to relax for five minutes in a quiet room. Measurements should be done preferably in a sitting or supine position. The arm should be fully bared and supported at the level of the heart. Measure the blood pressure in both the arms at the first visit and use the highest of the two readings. So that is the way the blood pressure should be measured. Now the principal is also sitting here. We know 500 patients in the cardiology OP. I have to confess that the blood pressure is not measured in the manner it has to be done. But this is the way it should be done and I, I can see the smile on everyone's face and if you deviate from that, your blood pressure measurement is likely to be wrong. And that gives the list of what will happen if it is not done properly, if the back is not supported if the cuff is not at the correct level, incorrect cuff size, the deflation is not proper, if multiple readings are not taken, if the blood pressure has to be properly taken, it will take at least 10 minutes. And we know the number of patients we examine in 10 minutes, not only blood pressure, the whole examination. So we have to change from that and I think we have to seriously think how it can be implemented. Now coming to another area that is the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. It has come in a big way, especially the European guideline. They give a lot of importance to that. This is actually a small device. The sigma magnetometer meter cuff is connected to the monitor by means of a tube that goes under the shirt. So this is the device and uh, the recording is done like that over a span of 24 hours and uh, this is how the, the, the thing will look like. So this is the blood pressure recording, this is the timing of the day, this is the systolic BP and this is the limit, this is the diastolic blood pressure. So this is how it will look like. So this is the daytime. 
this is the night time, this is the vesperal window, this is the matinal window, so that soon after the person gets up in the morning, there is a transient increase in blood pressure. And when the person goes to sleep, you find there is a nocturnal fall in blood pressure. These two things are extremely important. The nocturnal dipping and the early morning rise in blood pressure. Then there is something called the white coat window, that is immediately after the, 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 the cuff is connected and all that. Because of the anxiety there can be a transient increase in blood pressure. You also you have the daytime blood pressure, the nighttime blood pressure, you have the white coat window, the vesperal window, the matinal window, the night dip in blood pressure and the early morning increase in blood pressure. That is what you ordinarily get. Now various terminologies are there. You should know some idea about the mean blood pressure, the mean 24 hour blood pressure, the blood pressure variability and the different ways of expressing the blood pressure load like the percent time it is elevated, the hyperbaric impact, the diurnal index, the dipping pattern, the morning surge, the double product, multiple ways of quantifying the blood pressure. The problem with the office blood pressure reading is that it is taken at a given time. So we don't know what is happening during the routine 24 hours when the individual is doing the usual activities. Whereas if you are doing an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we get a clear idea of what is happening during 24 hours, spread over a long span of time. What is happening during night, what is happening during day, and we get a lot of things so that you will get a better insight about what is really happening. And we have normal values also. Similar to 140-90, we tell that the office blood pressure recording, the normal value has to be less than 140-90. Similarly, we have values for the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring also. So throughout the 24 hours, the value should be below 130 by 80. And during the daytime, we should have a value below 135 by 85. And the nighttime period, extremely important. The nocturnal blood pressure should be below 120 by 70. Because it is the nocturnal blood pressure which is more often correlated with left ventricular hypertrophy and evidence of target organ damage. So if you can get insight about the nocturnal blood pressure, we gain a lot of information. The other option which is available is the home blood pressure recording. That is very good. During the daytime when the patient is awake, when the person is awake, multiple readings can be taken. So you get an idea. But the problem is, in that you do not get idea about the nocturnal blood pressure. That is the big difference between home blood pressure recording and ambulatory blood pressure blood recording. Only in ambulatory blood pressure recording, you get a clear idea about what is happening during the night. And there is something called BP variability. This is increasingly recognized. A measure in millimeters of mercury by which each value deviates from the mean. Because you can have variation. B to B variation, variation within one hour. And normal value is 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Now people with significant BP variability, significant swings in blood pressure, that is correlated with target organ damage, coronary artery disease and stroke. And some other drugs which you use for hypertension, like calcium channel blocker, amlodipine, the BP variability will be significantly less. And ambulatory blood pressure monitoring has led to a reclassification of blood pressure and hypertension. Now what is shown here, this is the clinic blood pressure, that is the usual office blood pressure. And this is the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Now if both are elevated, that is a true hypertension. If both are elevated, it is a sustained true hypertension. If both are normal, 
it is a true normatus now you have individuals in whom you find consistently the clinic pressure is high whenever i go to the doctor the doctor examines and tells the bp is 160 100 150 100 but you do an ambulatory pressure monitoring you find the nocturnal bp is only 100 by 60 the daytime bp is only 130 by 80 so he is not really a hypertensive that is the so called white coat hypertension now there is an opposite of that the reverse of white coat hypertension what is that that is comparatively uncommon but increasingly recognized that is when the doctor takes the blood pressure in the clinic you find the bp is always normal you find values like 130 90 140 90 but you take an ecg there may be left ventricular hypertrophy there may be some evidence of hypertensive retinopathy you do an echo you may find left ventricular hypertrophy with diastolic dysfunction then you get stuck what is happening you do an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring you find the average blood pressure is elevated especially the nocturnal blood pressure this is what is called masked hypertension this is especially common in diabetic people especially diabetic women many people ask why the home bp is higher than the office bp maybe the home environment is worse than the office environment that could be the simple answer but such an entity really exists that is called mass hypertension so you remember these four things the normal bp sustained hypertension white coat hypertension reversed white coat hypertension or mass hypertension and the dipping status is very important normally you have fall in the bp when you go to sleep the nocturnal fall that should be around 10 to 20% that is the dippers now compared to people who have a dip in bp people who do not have a dip in bp you find almost two and a half fold increase in cardiovascular mortality now there is something called the reverse dipping that is very bad the nocturnal bp really increases what group of people you find you find this in people with chronic kidney disease during night the bp going up that is extremely bad that is linked to stroke mi sudden cardiac death you find almost 3 to 4 fold higher risk of cardiovascular mortality so this is how a normal abpm will look like in a normal person systolic bp diastolic bp there is some morning increase morning surge and there is a good nocturnal dip the nocturnal dip should be more than 10% 20 to 20% will be normal this is what is called the white coat hypertension overall you find the blood pressure is fairly normal the nocturnal bp is normal but if there is a stressful meeting or giving a talk you find record the bp you find bp going up so that is the stressful meeting this is white coat hypertension then some people with mild hypertension they have mild hypertension all right but on top of that they have a white coat effect the bp may be mildly elevated but a small stress suddenly there will be a significant increase in bp that is called white coat effect then some people with hypertension you find there is a good nocturnal dip the dip of around 10 to 20% such people do reasonably well even though they are hypertensive so hypertension with nocturnal dip is a good thing the outcome is reasonably good but then you have hypertension with no dip hypertensives non dipper the nocturnal bp fall is less than 10% so two hypertensives one fellow with nocturnal dip the other fellow without nocturnal dip the fellow without nocturnal dip the outcome is bad then you have the extremely bad situation no this is actually an extreme dipper that is uh, we don't really know whether it is good or bad but there is some link with this with stroke especially in the elderly and some link to coronary perfusion 
because coronary perfusion happened during diastole. So excessive dip and extreme dip, meaning BP fall more than 20%, that is also not very good. But what is extremely bad is the reverse dipper. This is very, very bad. You find the BP is all along elevated and during night, the nocturnal, the blood pressure still goes on increasing. This is what you find in chronic kidney disease. Sustained elevation of blood pressure with reverse dipping. So we can stratify people based on all this. So that is why the recent guideline, the European guideline, the ESC, ESH guideline, when should you do this, IM, this uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? Suspicion of white coat hypertension and white coat effect, suspicion of masked hypertension, identification of true and false resistant hypertension. This we have encountered many times. Patient coming to the OP, you add multiple tracks. Finally, patient may be on five tracks. Still, you find the BP is 160, 100. ECG is normal. You do an echo, there's no LVH. Then you think something is happening. You do an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, many times you will be surprised. The nocturnal BP is normal. All along the daytime, the blood pressure is reasonably normal. So that is what you find. That is not a true resistant hypertension. So before you label someone as having a resistant hypertension, it is good to find out whether he is taking drugs properly, of course, and do an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. 30%, one-third of your resistant hypertension will go out of that group of resistant hypertension and excessive drugs may not be required. And considerable variability of office blood pressure on different occasions. Then suspicion of autonomic, postural, postprandial and drug-induced hypertension. And in some people you find a marked discordance of office BP and home blood pressure. And assessment of dipping status and nocturnal hypertension. So these are all the important areas where it could be useful. But can we do this ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for every patient? The guideline recommend that, but it is controversial. So what will be the consensus? Okay, it is a little expensive. Availability is not all that good, but the point is it is very time consuming and patient discomfort. Because each time your cuff is getting inflated, the, most of the people feel that. It can interfere with the sleep. And do, throughout the day and night, you know, someone is squeezing your arm. It's not a very pleasant sensation. So people who have undergone the ABPM, if you ask them, most of the people are reluctant to undergo it a second time. That is a real practical difficulty. And normal values and cutoff levels, we are not too clear. And uh, the guideline tell, okay, if you have doubt, you do an ABPM and you find out whether he is hypertensive or not. You can do it at this point of time. But what about a year later? You cannot go on doing it every day. So it has some value, but use it in a, in a, you know, in a very careful manner. So that you have to be discreet about that. Now coming to the next aspect. What about the Indian scenario of hypertension? We have different uh, studies telling that the prevalence is increasing. The prevalence is around 30%. And if you take people above the age of 60 years, almost 60% are hypertensive. So beyond the age of 60 years, we have more hypertensives than normal people. And over a 50-year period, there was a much steeper increase in the prevalence of hypertension in the urban population than in the non-urban population, mainly because of the stress and other related factors. And uh, this is uh, another very disturbing thing. If you look at the prevalence of hypertension in India, it is around uh, 33%. But what about the number of people who are having the blood pressure under control? If you take the rural population, it is only around 10%. 90% it is not controlled. And in the urban population, it is just 20%. So this is one area where we have to improve. Now, what about the guidelines for hypertension? One problem is there are too many guidelines. For example, these are the four important guidelines. 
the so-called JNCH, the European Guideline, the AHA, the ACC Guideline, the ASH, the American Society of Hypertension. There is some difference in the threshold for drug treatment. Mostly it is 140 by 90, but in the new guideline, for people above the age of 60 years, they have put it as 150 by 90, which has triggered some controversy. Whereas in some other guideline, like the ASH and the European guideline, they feel that uh, up to the age of 80, it is better to have the blood pressure below 140, 90. And this element should be given only for people above the age of 80 years. So 60 to 80, we are not very clear about that. Similarly, the choice of drug. Most of the guidelines feel that beta blockers should not be a first-line drug. In fact, if you take the JNCH, they have given beta blocker a number 5 or a number 6 status. They tell about ACE inhibitor or ARB, they tell about calcium channel blocker, they tell about diuretic, and much lower down only they tell about beta blocker. Whereas if you take the European guideline, even now beta blocker is given a first line status. Now Indian guideline, though we don't have any separate studies and all that, still feel that beta blockers can be selected as a first-line therapy in selected patients. Now again, you know, when to initiate two drugs, monotherapy versus two drug treatment. Most of the people feel that if the BP is above 160, 100, straight away start with combination therapy. The rationale is that a single drug, the reduction in BP maximum possible is 20 systolic and 10 diastolic. So if your BP is above 160-100, straight away start with a combination therapy. And this is the 2013, the Indian Hypertension Guideline, at just one point, despite all the guidelines telling that beta blockers should be number 5, number 6 and all that, even now the Indian Guideline, in young people, when you tell about young people, we mean people below the age of 55. They feel that ACE inhibitors or ARB, and along with that, they have still put beta blocker. You find an asterisk there, indicating that it has to be a newer beta blocker, maybe nebivalol, bisoprolol, or carbidolol. But in people above the age of 55, the preference goes to a calcium channel blocker or diuretic. But most people feel that this B should not be there. It has to be an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. But Indian guideline still feel that in young people with a hyperdynamic circulatory state and resting fast heart rate, beta blocker is still a good option. And in people with heart failure or underlying coronary artery disease or another indication for beta blocker, still beta blocker has the first line status. So Indian guidelines still recommend beta blocker in young people. And another point is chlorthalidone is now the preferred diuretic. It is not really thiazide diuretic, it is thiazide-like diuretic. So we have three options. Loop diuretics are not good for hypertension. Now between thiazide diuretic and the thiazide-like diuretic, the preference is for thiazide-like diuretic, in which you have two. One is chlorthalidone and the other one is indapamide, especially the sustained release indapamide. We know that atinolol is not good and some of the guidelines tell that the newer beta blockers are good. Okay, they could be good. We have some data with bisoprolol, we have some data with carbidolol, we have little data with nebivalol, but remember, we do not have any outcome data with the newer beta blockers. So at this point of time, beta blockers cannot be strongly recommended as a first-line drug unless there is a compelling indication. Now, the benefit of beta blocker has been questioned. I am not going into the details, especially the LIFE study and the ASCOT trial. And so that is why we generally do not recommend beta blocker as a first-line drug, except in selected situations. Now, going to the another controversial part, the recent trials and their practical implications. The SPRINT trial and the HOPE-3 trial. 
the sprint trial basically tried to find out whether bringing down the systolic blood pressure below 120 is it beneficial or not. The CVD composite event rate is it lower with intensive lowering of BP, systolic BP below 120 compared to the standard treatment systolic BP below 140 in people who are not diabetic and looking at the primary outcome. And this is what they found. They found that intensive treatment arm had 25% lower risk of the primary outcome. If you put it in another way, the number needed to treat, we always tell about NNT, the number needed to treat to prevent a cardiac outcome even is 61. So if you treat 60 people with hypertension and bring the systolic BP below 120, maybe you can prevent one event. That is the conclusion of the sprint trial. But there were some safety issues. When you try to bring the BP below 120, people had more of hypotension. They had more of acute kidney injury and acute renal failure. 4.1% versus 2.5% and both these were statistically significant. The sprint trial concluded that Treatment effects are similar in all specified groups. Everyone is benefited and overall the benefit of more intensive BP lowering exceeded the potential for harm. But can we take it that way? Let us have a very closer look. In sprint trial, how was the blood pressure measured? That is very important. The patients were seated in a quiet area for 5 minutes. Then blood pressure was recorded by a commercially available automated unit that recorded three readings separated by several minutes and there should not be anyone else in the room. There is no doctor, there is no sister, it is unobserved. Is it the way we are recording the pressure? Certainly not. And the decision were based on the average of the three readings. Other studies have shown that this method of BP measurement yield substantially lower readings than does a single usual type of blood pressure which we all do. So the blood pressure of cardiology OP, if you record 140-90, by the sprint technique, it will be something like 120-70 or 120-80. So we cannot really translate sprint into clinical practice. So if you go by sprint, in our busy OP and try to bring all the blood pressure below 120-80, you will encounter a lot of hypotension, renal failure and all that. So if sprint is applied without attention to proper BP measurement, substantial overtreatment with a higher rate of adverse events are likely to occur. So the, the one or two small points which have come out of the sprint, one, chlorothalidone is good, it should be the preferred diuretic. Amlodipin is the best calcium blocker. Beta blockers are less effective. Now, we have another trial which came almost the same time. That is the HOPE 3 blood pressure trial. It had two arms. This is the blood pressure arm. They looked at almost the same thing. Whether aggressive lowering is good or bad. What did they find? See, this is what they found. There is no point in aggressively lowering the blood pressure. The outcome is the same. If you take the composite primary outcome, there is no difference. Now, if you look at the cardiovascular death, MI and stroke, it is the same. Whether aggressive blood pressure lowering or usual blood pressure lowering. That is again the same thing. MI, stroke, cardiac arrest, heart failure, everything is the same. And uh, this is seven year follow up. So it is not one or two months. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, they found that in the small group who had systolic BP above 143, okay, bringing down could be beneficial, but not in people with systolic BP between 120 and 140. So what does it mean? So the consensus, excessive lowering of blood pressure is not good. And the emphasis was on proper blood pressure measurement. 
rather than aggressively lowering it to a low level. So the comments from the authors, our findings contradict the lower is better hypothesis in the sprint trial. So I think we will go by our earlier 140 by 90, which is good enough. Sprint should not change our practice pattern. Now, special case, hypertension in diabetes and CKD, we have some data. The ECON blood pressure trial, around 5,000 people with diabetes, vascular disease or higher risk, creatinine not more than 1.5. They were randomized to group two groups aiming to bring the systolic BP below 140 versus below 120. And what did they find? They found that there was no significant difference. This is the difference in the blood pressure. In the aggressive arm, the blood pressure was much lower. But when you look at the event rate, at the end of eight years, you find there is no difference. So aggressive lowering of blood pressure is not beneficial in diabetic people also. And very enthusiastic blood pressure lowering can even be deleterious, especially in people with cardiovascular disease and people who are prone for stroke. So what should be the goal blood pressure? I think in most of the people, it should be below 140 by 90. Maybe people above the age of 80 years, 150 by 90. People between 60 and 80, okay, maybe 145 or something like that. Aim at 140, but even 150 will be reasonable if he is not a very high risk individual. Now, what about people with diabetes? If the individual does not have any other problem, has no proteinuria, 140 by 90 will be reasonable. But young diabetic people, if you can achieve a BP of 130 by 85, okay. If it can be achieved with one or two tracks, that will be desirable. ACE inhibitors and ARBs will be preferred because of the renal protection and vascular protection. Now, what about people with CKD? 140 by 90 is reasonable. But if you can achieve a lower blood pressure without much discomfort, it will be desirable. In fact, if you go at the nephrology guideline, in people without albuminuria, 140 by 90 is reasonable. But if there is albuminuria, you find value exceeding microalbuminuria, more than 30 milligrams for 24 hours. If you want to arrest the proteinuria, 130 by 80 will be desirable, which I think will be the consensus. Now, before I conclude, a word about chronopharmacology. This is a rather new term. A question very often asked, patients also ask, should I take my tablet in the morning or in the evening? This may not be important for people who take a handful of tablet because they have tablet in the morning, noon, night, every time. But single tablet, because we want compliance. So as far as possible, we combine combination single tablet should be given in the morning or should at night. Because we have some trials. I am not going into the details of the trial. This is one is the MAPEC trial. They found that there is some lower risk with evening dosing. The lower risk of total cardiovascular events. The cardiovascular death, MI or stroke with evening dosing compared to the morning dose. Maybe because morning you get the surge the catecholamine related surge, more increase in BP, more increase in heart rate, more chance for platelet aggregation, and uh, the, all those things could be contributing. There was a good trial coming up, it is called the time trial. Treatment in morning versus evening, that is time. The time trial, the result will be available by 2019. More than 10,000 patients. After that we can answer whether the tablet should be given in the morning or at night. We have other trials also, I am not going into the detail. But now we have some data telling that giving it in the night is better. This is the Cochrane Review, 2011. They found there is no difference in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular morbidity, no significant difference in the overall adverse event or withdrawal. But they found better blood pressure control with bedtime dosing. The clinical significance, we are not too sure. So let me conclude. Hypertension continues to remain as a condition of public health importance in India. The methodology to measure accurate BP should be given due importance. 
Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is a useful tool in certain situations, but you should use it in a discreet manner. Although recent trials have provided useful information for lowering BP further, usual goals of BP should be followed. They are good enough. BP goal can be lowered further selectively, carefully in special population. The choice of drugs for controlling BP should be individualized till more data emerges. Evening dosing of the antihypertensives can be advised. And at the end of that, the final statement, it is high time that India, we have our own cardiovascular outcome trial. Because it's, it is actually a shame that uh, last country, big country like India, we still have to depend on the Western studies to have the guideline. We tell about the Indian guideline, it is not based on any Indian data, because we have no Indian data. So I think everyone should, we should all try for that. And thank you once again to Candela Pharma for this.